My name is Stacy Levy. I am a speech and language pathologist, a literacy specialist, and the president of IDA Georgia, the International Dyslexia Association. Can okay. you tell us a little bit about what you do and how long you've been doing it? So I um, have been a speech and language pathologist. I graduated with my master's in 1997, which make, um, I think that's 25 years of working. I'm almost 50, so I'm old. And I own, in Atlanta, I own a private practice, um, which is my name, Stacy Levy and Associates. And my practice, it specializes in working with kids. It's a pediatric practice. And we work with many kids who have dyslexia, many many kids who have persistent difficulties in speech and language also have dyslexia. Okay. So my practice um, is this niche area of working with kids with a dual diagnosis, having both dyslexia and other coexisting language or articulation weaknesses. How is what you teach different than a regular teaching curriculum? For oh, that's, a, that's a good question. So IDA Georgia and really not IDA Georgia, the International Dyslexia Association, we promote the use of what's called structured literacy. The term structured literacy is the way individuals with dyslexia will learn to read. The slogan is until everyone reads. Most public school curriculums unfortunately do not follow a structured literacy approach. All of the money that we raise, so it's a nonprofit, I'm president, but it's all volunteer. Um, it's all, all of my volunteer time goes into this. Our mission is to train teachers in public schools so that they understand how to teach individuals with dyslexia how to read. All of the research shows that structured literacy is what is needed. Um, there are many structured literacy programs. The most common one heard in Atlanta is Orton Gillingham. There are um, other programs like Wilson and Linda Mood Bell and um, others that also follow uh, structured literacy methodology. Very, wow. very interesting. Um, <laughs> Could you discuss the role of phonics in the teaching of reading as opposed yeah. to memorization? It's a great question. So a structured literacy program is phonics based in that, yes, kids absolutely need to learn phonics in order to be successful with literacy. However, so a structured literacy approach typically will take, will teach the phonics and then you know how English has all of those words that are rule breakers? Mm -hmm, like yeah. if I try to sound out the word B-O-U-G-H-T, I look at it, I know it's bought, like I bought something at the store. Mm -hmm. But if I try to sound it out phonetically, I'm going to go bow good. And mm -hmm. I can't, it's not. Right, right. So a structured literacy approach teaches the phonics, which are absolutely fundamental and necessary. We need phonics mm -hmm. to be able to spell, to be able to decode words, at least start words. But then they, they teach the rule breakers. So like Orton Gillingham refers to them as red words. Other programs call them um, like criminal words because they're bad. They break the law <laughs> um, or trick words, you know, things like that. But what happens in the schools is just like with any diagnosis, individuals with dyslexia will have different presentations. Mm -hmm. So sometimes kids are just memorizing words. Right, yeah. And they yeah. don't know. So I actually worked, um, gosh, it was many, many years ago, um, called Grove Park Elementary. And I heard it's not even around anymore. But I just remember that I, I shared with you that I'm also a speech pathologist. Right, right. And I was a young therapist and I go and I look at the, her, you know, her records and she was noted to be a stutterer. Okay. So mm -hmm. that she was getting speech therapy for stuttering. Okay. So I go and pick her up. She was in the fifth grade. I'll just never forget it. So I pick her up 
beautiful girl, very articulate. We're talking away. Don't hear any stuttering. I'm like, mm-hmm. what the heck is this? Why is this girl like, why am I supposed to be working as a speech therapist with her in stuttering? Mm-hmm. So when I get back, I notice that all of the goals are for reading. So I'm like, here, honey, like, let's read this for me. She was completely illiterate. Like, she, I'm not, she had only memorized words. She did not, like, so when in a structured literacy program, they typically include nonsense words. So words right. that you're just, you have to sound them out, right? Like V-U-M, vum. Like, I can't look at it. I have to sound it out. I gave her a bunch of those. And she looked at me like I had three eyes. Like, she's like, I don't know what to do with this. She had straight A's wow. and in the fifth grade. So she ended up getting tested and, you know, they confirmed it, um, of course. And she, I, her IQ was crazy high. It was like a 140 something. Wow. So basically she was very verbal. She tricked everybody and they kept thinking she was just a stutterer. So she would start to read a word mm-hmm. and she'd be like, but, 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 and they would give her the word. And then she would keep going because oh. she had memorized so many yeah. that she was able to fool everybody. So to answer your question, you had said, why are phonics so important? Mm-hmm. Other than, you know, just based on, uh, uh, instead of just memorization, well, you can actually memorize and the higher your IQ is, the more words you can memorize. Right. You can memorize enough words to get through comprehending like about third grade curriculum, even, even higher. And it, but if you cannot sound out words and you don't understand that words are these things that are made up of sounds and parts and parts of sounds, you're never going to become a fully fluent reader and you're not going to be able to map on new words. Right. Yeah. So you kind of touched on this. Uh, if you want to just add to it, if not, that's fine. Uh, what In what ways do students with dyslexia read differently, would you say? Um, well, I think it depends on where they are in their teaching, you know? So if an individual with dyslexia is diagnosed, and they really, you can diagnose very young, even as young as like five for sure, but even by age four, especially if there's a sibling with dyslexia, you know, we mm-hmm. can see all the early indicators. So if they get intervention like in Orton Gillingham or that kind of approach in kindergarten or first grade, very often they really don't read differently. Like they, their fluency can be every bit as, as accurate as a neurotypical peer. So yeah. it, it, it just depends on the severity Um, it depends on when the intervention happened. So I think it depends on every individual. Now, if you have an older child that isn't diagnosed and never gets the proper remediation, well, you're going to hear them do a lot of like, I described it as stuttering, but Mm -hmm. almost will sound like that. You'll hear a lot of word repetitions starting a word without being able to finish it, difficulty sounding out words. Sometimes they'll just guess based on the first letter yeah. and they'll miss like, you know, so like if the word is broken, for example, they might just say broke and not say the N because they they just look at it, you know, and don't get the entire word. So I think it depends. Like my daughter is 15 um, she absolutely has a dyslexic brain, but I started working with her at three. So she's oh. a beautiful reader and you would never know that she had, to, you know, that she had this difficulty. I would have been diagnosed as dyslexic in my day. People just weren't diagnosed. Uh, I, I was able to compensate, um, very well. Yeah. I mean, it's a good question. So I think it just really depends on the individual and, and where they are, you know, and what kind of services they they've received. You know, I always say like one of the missions of IDA Georgia is to go into every public school, have a screening test because one out of five individuals has dyslexia. If they were all taken and put into one class and taught in the same way, we would actually save our country billions of dollars because it gets kids on like if if you can read you can do so much so what are some things you think a teacher could do to help improve a classroom environment for a dyslexic child i would say continuing education 
um, a plot, you know, so for example, in IDA Georgia, we have teacher grants. And sometimes we're like posting on social media, trying to like give away the money, like getting teachers, you know, so, and that's part of our mission too, is really to try to connect with, you know, as many public school teachers as possible. So they know that they can reach out to us to get scholarships. But I think being cognizant that all of the research points to the need for structured literacy. And again, we're talking about 20% of our population, right? Like of a, a, a students. And in all actuality, really every student benefit from a structured literacy approach. So a lot of the private schools have just gone that way. Like mm -hmm. they, every kindergarten are using structured literacy. And so I think being cognizant of that and talking to their principals, if they can't afford to do it on their own, you know, getting, applying, asking to be trained, and then just making sure that the training they sign up for is, you know, IDA is a great resource because if it's an IDA approved training, you know, it follows a structured literacy approach. Right. So I think the big buzzword is structured literacy. I know I've said that like a thousand times. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's important. It's definitely very yeah. important. Can you talk about the effects of dyslexia on a child's mindset, such as self-confidence, et cetera? Yep. This is going to be very specific to the individual and what kind of intervention they've had. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. like kids who are fortunate enough to go to a, um, a private school that specializes in dyslexia, like the Skank School, for example, mm -hmm. those kids leave full of confidence and they wear their dyslexia as a badge of honor, because right, that's how yeah. they're taught. you know, they're like, welcome to skate, you're dyslexic and congratulations. And here's why it's awesome. Mm -hmm. But then you have to think of kids in a lower socioeconomic that can never afford something like a skank. And they're not low enough to qualify for an IEP, or they do qualify for an IEP, but they're with a teacher who's not trained in structured literacy. Mm -hmm. So you can have two very different um, presentations as far as how they feel and their confidence and so forth. So I think the answer is really going to be very individual, individualized, depending on how they were taught, you know, and, the, and how their mindset is based on how the information was disseminated to them. Like one example is, um, you know, I'm using this from a personal example with my daughter, when she was in the fourth grade, she also has ADHD and um, she started on medication and I wanted her to feel really positive about it and not look at it as a negative. And she's a competitive gymnast or she was now she cheers, but Simone Biles was one of her idols. And she, it was right when she came out as having ADHD and was talking about it after the Olympics with the um, you know, there was that controversy of her taking her ADHD medication. And I just remember, she's like, Simone Biles has ADHD, you know? And mm -hmm. so she was never, she's never, she really felt bad at all about it. Like she always just says, yeah, I have ADHD and it doesn't bother her. And, or, and she likes to say, well, I have a dyslexic brain, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So I think it's just going to vary from kiddo to kiddo. That's definitely true. I've talked to a lot of different kids and you can definitely see, you know, where the confidence is and where it's not, uh, depending on where they've been. What are some things a parent should consider when looking for a tutor after the child is diagnosed? You know, definitely somebody who is trained in structured literacy. Ideally, the person who is as specialized as possible, like trained in as many different programs as possible. But really, I, I would just stick with the structured literacy approach. Like that's what's most important. Um, it's also important though, to have a really good solid evaluation because no two individuals are the same, right? Mm -hmm. You can have two kids, same age, same IQ even, but they might have very different dyslexic profiles. So it's just a matter of being able to have a tutor who can take the information from like a, uh, from a testing, from an evaluation and know exactly where to begin and to avoid scams. Sorry. Like there, there are like so many bad programs out there. One example, and it's not even around nowadays, but I always think about it. Like I remember seeing commercials that said, my baby can read 
but they were basically starting with babies and teaching sight words. Mm -hmm. And so there are programs like that are very heavy sight word focus. Yeah. And so you get that immediate success. And that's the problem in public schools as well, is the principal only cares about what their testing scores test look words, like. Right. So State if they're, scores. yes. So if they're doing a sight word approach and the kids are getting enough, right? that they can score high enough on the test, then they're not looking necessarily at the big picture to say, well, when this child hits middle school, they're going to stop being able to, to keep up and they're going to end up, you know, failing and dropping out. Like that's, that's where the problem is. So, so I've had so many kids come in my practice that have been through so many other therapies and interventions that aren't working and the parents have just lost so much time and money. All right. So next question, what accommodations in the classroom do you think are most helpful for dyslexic students? Yeah, most often. And again, I'll always, you know, it's always going to be very student specific. If you're diagnosed with dyslexia, there's a very high chance that you have a comorbid diagnosis, like, like ADHD or a language disorder <clears throat> or, you know, or, or something or anxiety or something else. So like, mm -hmm. it's important to that every child is different, but in my experience, usually extended test taking time tends to be one of the most important because it gives the individual a chance to go back and reread the material and right. take that time so that you're able to actually show true skill, you know, it levels the playing field. And there are so many other strategies that, you know, may or may not be needed just depending on the individual presentation. But the extended time is one that I, I see used the most mm -hmm. often and is, is the most needed, but there are definitely others depending on the profile. For sure. So good, having accurate testing and diagnosis and looking at comorbidity is super important um, as well. Last question. What advice do you have for parents who are just now finding out their child is dyslexic? I would hope they would reach out to IDA Georgia, you know, for resources, free resources and so forth, because I know it can be very overwhelming. And I think, you know, the what's most important is accurate diagnosis, also really looking at the comorbidity. And I know I keep saying that, but sometimes when a parent gets a diagnosis, they'll grasp onto just one thing. Like Orton Gillingham, for example, teaches phonics, but many dyslexics will struggle with reading comprehension. That's not dyslexia specifically, right? So they might need to work on with a language specialist on, on language comprehension. I, I think my advice would be to take, you know, if they've gotten the diagnosis, they have the testing. So to really make sure that they understand the testing results. And if they don't, to, you know, advocate, go back to the psychologist or the, the tester and really make sure they understand and then, you know, to make sure that structured literacy is a part of, uh, is usually the first step, is part of the intervention. If it's cost prohibitive to do tutoring and so forth, to really access the resources in our community. Like the Skank School started the DRT, the Dyslexia Resource Trust, or actually I think they rebranded and I can't remember the new name, but the point is, is that they offer tutoring services at a more nominal fee. And a lot of cities, uh, now that I've gotten, now that I'm president of IDA Georgia and meeting presidents, you know, from states all around our, our country, and it's amazing how progressive we are in Atlanta. There's so much understanding of dyslexia and, and so many resources available to the community that we just don't see in other, um, in other cities. Thank you so much, Ms. Levy. Thank you for your time. So much helpful information. I know it's going to help so many people. So thank you, really.